thrilled to be here today with our leading breast cancer experts who are searching for ways to improve outcomes globally, specifically in low resource communities in the US and countries around the world. Just last year, the World Health Organization announced that breast cancer has become the most commonly diagnosed cancer in the world, impacting 2.3 million people globally. And while many Western nations have significantly reduced deaths from breast cancer over the last 30 years, by 43% here in the US alone, same has not held true in low resource countries or even across different populations within the US. So I'm very happy to introduce to you today, Dr. Shulman. Dr. Shulman is a specialist in the treatment of patients with breast cancer and his research includes development of new cancer therapies and implementation of cancer treatment programs in low resource settings. He has helped establish cancer programs in Rwanda, Haiti, and Botswana, places where historically the chance for a successful outcome was greatly diminished because of delayed and later stage breast cancer diagnoses. And I'd like to introduce Dr. Sonia Reed, who's working to help us better understand health disparities in breast cancer, yeah. and young, set, young onset breast cancer and hereditary breast cancer. Specifically, she is investigating genomic differences that may be contributing to the racial survival disparity in breast cancer. Dr. Reed is also focused on improving healthcare delivery to underserved communities and increasing the representation of minority patients in clinical trials. She is also actively involved in breast cancer research in Jamaica, her home country as well. So welcome to you both. Dr. Schulman, you've been treating breast cancer patients here and around the world for over 40 years. Can you paint a picture for us of what the global state of breast cancer is today and how it has changed from when you first started? Well, now that you've already called me out as being old, <laughs> which obviously I am. No, uh, wise, wise. <laughs> Um, I entered Harvard Medical School in 1971, and that was the year that President Nixon signed the National Cancer Act and declared his war on cancer. Uh, and that was one of the things that got me excited about this field, because we were starting to develop tools to treat our patients who had different forms of cancer. But looking back over those 50 years, uh, what we were doing in the 1970s was pretty primitive, um, frankly, pretty brutal really hard on our patients, physically and otherwise, and the cure rates were still very low. And I think one of the remarkable things for me, looking back now over a half a century, is how far we've come. And frankly, it's also been through the help and vision and direction of BCRF, uh, which has funded myself and Sonia and so many of the breast cancer researchers, uh, not only in the US, but around the world, and so today, 50 years later, we have remarkably better treatments. We have remarkably better survival rates. And the patients who are surviving are surviving with many fewer side effects than they had uh, all those decades ago. But as you inferred, um, these advances are not available uh, uniformly around the world. Um, in many places, uh, they're not available at all. When I first went to Rwanda, which is one of the places I work, uh, I work in, in 2011, there wasn't a single cancer doctor in the country, and there was no cancer treatment. And if you got cancer, you died. That's what the patients would tell us, and it was true. Um, as Sonia will talk about, there are also places in the U.S. where we're not delivering the remarkable treatments that we've now discovered. So we still have a lot of work to do. Um, and part of what I'm concentrating on is trying to bring these advances to other women around the world so that they can take advantage of them and survive their cancer. Well, I think the Cancer Act inspired a lot of us who were of a certain age. I was in grade school when that came out and I was like, well, sure, I'm gonna go cure cancer. So I think that was a very big deal and the progress that has been made over the last 50 years is tremendous, but as you say, it doesn't reach everyone. Dr. Reed, we know that breast cancer outcomes, or in other words, who survives the disease, varies greatly even right here in the US. Can you tell us about the work that you're doing to understand why these disparities exist? 
Yeah, you know, when we think about um, disparities, as Lara was mentioning, it's not just um, overseas in low income areas, we see that right here in our backyards, so wherever we practice right here in Nashville, for example, I'm at Vanderbilt, but close to us um, is a county hospital, right? And we know that sometimes patients that receive care in certain environments don't get the quality of care that they need to receive, right? And that does impact what um, their outcome will be. So when we think about disparities, it's not just, I don't wanna say not, it's, it's a combination of factors, right? We think about access to adequate care, care as we have alluded to, their social determinants of health, just where you live. Are you able to access insurance to access, for example, an NCI designated site that may or may not accept the insurance that you have? Um, what are some of your comorbidities even starting along that journey before diagnosis? Were you able to get screening at, the adequate, um, at an adequate center that has the optimal screening machine, for example? Example, right. But we also know that there are perhaps biological differences. And I know that that was discussed or alluded to earlier, right? We know that Black patients, for example, are more likely to have triple negative breast cancer. And even patients that have hormone positive breast cancer perhaps are having even more aggressive types of hormone positive breast cancer. So there are some biological underpinnings that are contributing to some of these disparities. And then we talk about genomics, right? We, um, it's a, I want to say understudied perhaps area when we think about disparities, because we know that not enough Black patients are receiving genetic testing, not enough Black patients are receiving genomic assays to guide their treatment. Um, so a lot of the knowledge that we have in that space is really, it, it's pretty under uh, underrepresented, right? Because we don't have enough information to even understand what's going on. Um, but I think it's one of those things that you really have to start kind of taking it layers by layers to try to understand, is it an access, trying to kind of figure out what's the first step? Are we going to start looking at um, biological or non-biological factors? And I think it's really a combination of the two when we think about what's driving these disparities. Right, right. Yes, and um, Larry, your career in research also includes the development of new cancer therapies and implementation of cancer treatment programs in these low resource settings. What inspired you in the first place to focus on that area? And when did that focus become global? So um, I've always been interested in the delivery of cancer care and trying to make sure that we effectively and fairly deliver the cancer treatments that we can uh, throughout the US. And that was a lot of my focus in the first decades of my career. Uh, but in the early 1990s, uh, I met a guy named Paul Farmer, who was actually my intern at the Brigham when I was the attending on the oncology service, and we became friends. And he was devoted to bringing uh, health care uh, to people around the world who did not have good access to it. And he was the one who asked me to develop cancer programs in Rwanda and Haiti, um, which I did, and through the incredible support of BCRF. Um, have been able to develop over now more than a decade. Uh, and, um, you know, so there's a humanitarian mission to this, obviously. Um, we're, we're a global community. You know, we're all in this together, so to speak. And I think that it's part of our responsibility in a country that does have more resources than others, though Sonia said, not evenly distributed, to try to make the, figure out ways to make those resources available to other people in the world. I will say that um, there are two other things I'd like to mention. One, uh, Sonia's mentioned the biologic differences, and it's a complicated landscape. And for instance, um, we're now starting to learn, I work in East Africa. Many of the blacks in the US came from West Africa. Uh, which is where the slave trade came from. And uh, it turns out that breast cancer is biologically different in East Africa and West Africa. And we're actually just starting to learn about that. And that type of knowledge benefits everybody everywhere. Um, the other thing I would say is that uh, the things that we learn about how to provide uh, complex and effective cancer care in resource constrained settings like Rwanda, um, are actually applicable in lots of places in the U.S. And I remember uh, being asked to give a talk at the National Cancer Policy Forum a few years ago about our work in Rwanda. And two talks later, there was a talk about cancer care in rural Alabama. Um, and actually, the talks were pretty similar. 
Uh, and there's a lot of cross-learning uh, between some of the underserved areas in the U.S. and some elsewhere in the world. Well, thank you for that. And, you know, I've heard you talk about how some of the things that you've learned can not only be applied to other places in Africa, but that are low resource settings, but that you've brought some of it back to Philadelphia and places, you know, parts of Philadelphia that have low resource settings. Um, Dr. Reed, you started your career in Jamaica and then came to the United States. Could you please share with us a little bit about that experience? Yeah, um, I think Larry set that up very nicely because it's the same. Um, it, that really was my lesson in coming to the United States. You know, Jamaica, um, beautiful island, but of course, under-resourced um, um, and, and a developing country, right? So I did my medical school training there and saw a lot of unfortunate circumstances where patients were just not able to even have their cancer treated because they just did not have access to treatment um, or patients coming in with maybe a fungating mass um, because they didn't know what to do in between feeling that lump and getting diagnosed. Um, getting diagnosed because there was no infrastructure for screening and diagnostics, et cetera. So, you know, that weighed on me heavily as a medical student where I wonder to myself, you know, you're learning all this in that textbook and you know the optimal treatment, but here it is, you're seeing patients and not able to offer adequate care to these patients. And then fast forward, I came to the United States and did my residency training here in Nashville, um, working at a county hospital. And it blew my mind that I, in a developed country, I saw so many similarities where these patients were coming in with sometimes late stage diseases because they didn't have insurance perhaps, or they were underinsured. Um, mistrust with the medical system, for example, like there were so many similarities. I felt, I almost felt I could connect more with some of these patients because of my background um, in Jamaica. So, you know, when I think about global oncology, I really think about it more as a shared learning for us to really be able to apply what we learn here, elsewhere, and vice versa. Yes, and Larry, maybe you could talk a little bit too then about your biggest takeaways from what you've been doing um, there in Africa mm -hmm. and what's worked and how that can be brought to other countries to emulate that success, um, including even back into the U.S. Yeah, so I think those are really important points. And a lot of the things that make cancer care hard for pa patients to take advantage of in a place like Rwanda is things like poverty, you know, and People, women are more worried about putting their next meal on the table for their yeah, children yeah. than they are about going and getting breast cancer screening or other medical care. I mean, that's how they have to prioritize things. Uh, transportation is a huge issue in Rwanda. But when you look at Philadelphia, which is where I am, um, really only a few miles from here in West Philadelphia, there's really the same issues. Uh, financial hardship and priorities to try to use your time to take care of your family are major issues. When we ask our patients from West Philadelphia what the biggest obstacle to get coming and getting care in a timely fashion, they tell us transportation. Um, and they're, they're not that far away. And yet, you know, if you're coming to get um, chemotherapy, you got to have somebody to bring you you know, and you've got to have a way to get here. Public transportation doesn't work for people who are getting four hours of chemotherapy uh, and don't feel well and have to figure out how to get back uh, to the metro. So, um, you know, they have to have somebody to do it and they often don't. And then who's going to take care of the kids and who's going to, you know, put, you know, bring the money in and, and you know, do the working. And so a lot of the things, poverty, transportation, prioritization, um, really food challenges, they're, they're present right down the block from me. And so um, we now have um, you know, several initiatives, and I think this has all been brought to our attention more in the last few years because of um, events that we all know of, um, to use some of the same strategies that we use in Rwanda in West Philadelphia, supplying transportation, which we do in Rwanda, and now we're doing for our patients in West Philadelphia working on food insecurity, working on housing uh, and financial toxicity. Those are all the things we've done now for a decade in Rwanda. And we're now a decade later, just starting to do them in West Philadelphia. Yes, it's, um, 
really quite amazing and interesting how so many of these social determinants of health, as these are called, um, are, that are play here for disparities in the US are really very much the same as a play globally. Um, Sonia, let's dive a little bit deeper into the biology and specifically the genomic differences that you're investigating. What do we know so far? Yeah. <laughs> um, so I guess I'll break it into two main sections. So when we think of genomics, there's tumor gen genomics, and then there's germline that you're born with, um, right? So germline or somatic. So a lot of the differences that I've been focused on um, as it relates to hormone receptor positive breast cancer focuses on the tumor differences, right? Because we know among hormone positive breast cancer, which is the most common type of breast cancer, even among black patients, right? So I know um, triple negative breast cancer is overrepresented among black patients, but hormone receptor positive breast cancer still accounts for approximately um, just around 70% of all breast cancer in black patients, right? And then we think about why are black patients still dying more frequently from HR positive breast cancer? So looking at the tumor biology to try to answer some of those questions, I have done um, sequencing with the blueprint signature with Agendi. And what we found was that their black patients were more likely to have base subtype of hormone receptor positive breast cancer, which is actually more similar to a triple negative um, type of biology, right? So these are patients that have hormone positive breast cancer that are perhaps not benefiting from hormone blockers as you would expect them to benefit from, and maybe you should be treated more with chemotherapy like triple negative breast cancer, right? So that in and, in and of itself tells us that even when we look at hormone positive breast cancer overall, we did see some differences. And that I presented that I think last year at ASCO, we see differences in the tumor makeup of these hormone positive breast cancer patients, right? And then when we look at germline, it's a struggle, right? Because we know patients are still not being tested. Um, for germline mutations, despite us having so much information, so much um, um, options for these patients, not only for prevention, but now for treatment, right? So what we have seen is that in certain countries, for example, Bahamas, those patients actually have more BRCA mutations, both BRCA1 and 2 mutations, right? So then, and that's not the same, for example, even in Jamaica. Jamaica has even lower rates of BRCA mutation um, than the United States. So you realize that there's definitely a lot of admixture when we think globally about what hereditary breast cancer looks like like even among Black patients racially, right? Because we know there are so much ancestral differences. So a lot of times we lump everyone together, but we know that there are some inherent differences there. So my project that's funded um, from BCRF and Estee Lauder actually is looking at hereditary breast cancer patients, trying to look at a diverse cohort, because we know that we have actually not had such cohorts previously and trying to understand, can we understand some difference, some disparities that may be accounting some differences that may be accounting for some of these disparities among her hereditary breast cancer patients, both from the tumor standpoint, as well as access to treatment and how their treatment, how their care is delivered. Yeah, well, we look very much forward to you know, hearing results from that. Um, Absolutely. You know, as Larry mentioned, work being done that looks at the specific differences between West Africa mm -hmm. and East Africa. Yeah. And other BCRF researchers are involved in some of that work, but this, you know, especially in terms of that um, type of hormone receptor positive breast cancer, but response to therapy as well, which is clearly different. Um, you know, this work is very important for that. Um, what steps do you need to take, do we need to take to eliminate disparities here in the U.S. and around the world? I'll start with you, Larry. Well, I, I wanted to, um, emphasize what Sonia was just saying, because I think that's one of the answers to your question, which is we need to understand breast cancer in different populations. And, um, you know, you are the Breast Cancer Research Foundation. You have been wonderful in funding the work that I do in Rwanda and allowing us to do this, but we do it in a scientific and a research manner. Um, so we keep incredibly careful records because it's not clear that somebody who has hormone receptor positive breast cancer, as Sonia was just saying, is gonna respond the same to treatments in Rwanda as they are in the US. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, not only do we need to figure out how to help the patients 
have access to the treatment that they need, but we need to learn each step along the way uh, more about the biology of their disease, more about how their disease and they respond to the therapies um, and not make any assumptions. We can't go to Rwanda and assume that the same treatments that I'm using in Philadelphia for a Caucasian, white Caucasian woman is gonna have the same effect in a woman who lives in Rwanda. Uh, we have to study that. And through the generosity of PCRF, we are studying that, we are learning, but those lessons, the, that knowledge helps everybody everywhere because it expands our basic understanding of breast cancer biology. And Sonia? Yeah, I mean, I couldn't agree more. I think we have to have diverse representation in our trials, in our um, database, in order to understand. So I think one of the first steps, um, I believe, in getting to the root of disparities is actually having the patients to be able then to understand what's happening. So from clinical trials, when we're trying, to, when we're starting from the get go, are those clinical trials? Um, set up in a way that's going to accommodate patients that have transportation barriers? Are those clinical trials being intentional about opening those trials at sites that have um, diverse patients there? Or are we unintentionally or maybe intentionally excluding some of these patients? And then 10 years from now, we're not going to have these answers because we didn't have those patients in those studies. Yes, and I think, you know, in addition to clinical trials, there needs to be more diverse representation even earlier in research, you know, in more basic research. Breast cancer cell lines from more diverse patients that so much early work is done on and that ultimately get us to the clinical trial. Um, so really across the whole spectrum. Um, I do want to say that BCRF is a um, major supporter of the translational breast cancer um, research consortium, which TBCRC, which runs uh, clinical trials, and they have presented data in the last year, uh, going back and looking, that at their sites, they actually enroll uh, population representative uh, percentages in clinical trials. And one of the things that they do, and they remarked on this and how successful it is, is they present the trial to every patient. And I think that goes a lot of way to helping to get more um, participation in clinical trials. Um, so what impact, impact do you expect COVID to have on research and patient care around the world? And what can we do to help? And I'll start with you, Sonia, this time. Yeah. I worry that uh, disparities may actually were, um, widen. Um, and the reason we know we have seen across the board, not just in one community, but across the board, there've been a lot of delays in screening. I think hopefully we're catching up some, but right, a lot of patients in 2020 when things were locked down, um, there was a lot of delays just in screening um, as well as diagnostics, right? Getting patients diagnosed. I think a lot of research um, funding slow down as well, not just here, but globally. I saw that even in Jamaica where things were put on hold and actually some of those things haven't even started to ramp back up because everybody is still trying to get back to the new normal, if that's a thing, right? So I think not just from a screening standpoint, but even from a um, investigation and scientific um, um, standpoint, there have been a lot of um, a lot of setbacks. So I think we really have to now perhaps double down because you know you got you we were going forward, then we went back and hopefully we can catch up and then move forward is what I would say. Yeah. So I, I would add a couple to that. I obviously a couple of points. I obviously agree completely with Sonia. Um, when uh, the pandemic started in March of 2020, it seems like a lifetime ago, three years ago. Um, our breast cancer group at Penn was meeting every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, three times a week, trying to figure out how to adjust our treatments based on the restrictions of healthcare that we had available because our hospital was full of COVID patients. Uh, we had OR restrictions and other restrictions. And um, what that did, um, which, you know, that maybe there's a silver lining to almost any, everything, it made us start to question what we did. A lot of the stuff we do in life and in medicine is by habit, you know, and it's the habits that we've accumulated over decades. And so we really went back and analyzed every approach that we had to every aspect of breast cancer care. 
And I think that helped us to think about things with a clean whiteboard, you know, a clean slate. Um, and I think that was actually helpful in expanding sort of our curiosity and our desire to look at new ways uh, to treat people. The other thing that happened um, is that we had to think about new ways to do clinical trials uh, because patients were very restricted in their ability to come into our major centers. Mm -hmm. Transportation was even more of an issue than it usually was. We were trying to keep people out of our hospitals as much as possible. We were using telemedicine more to communicate not only with our regular patients, but with our clinical trials patients. Uh, and we were thinking about ways, in fact, to have patients participate in clinical trials without the burden that we often put on them about extra visits and so on and so forth. And that actually uh, has the potential to reduce some of the disparities in clinical trial enrollment. And uh, we've followed that very, very carefully at Penn. Um, we're proud of the fact that we actually have higher enrollment uh, of Blacks in our clinical trials than the percentage of Blacks in our community. Um, and we've worked hard. That hasn't happened by accident. Uh, and we've tried to keep some of the things that we put in place during COVID to make clinical trials more accessible and more manageable for patients. Uh, than they were before. So sometimes a disruption as terrible as COVID has been, and it's been absolutely awful, makes us do things in ways that we were, were unconventional for us that can have some benefits. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> Let's finish by looking ahead to the future of breast cancer research and what are you most excited about? So, yeah. Hmm. Um, what am I most excited about? It's a hard one. Um, I would say discovery. I think, you know, breast cancer is such a fascinating field. If we should do a history course on just treatment and diagnostics that have come about over the last um, 40 years, right, with, it, um, with breast cancer, I think it's truly fascinating how many drugs we have had, how we have understood her too low is now a thing, right? Like it really just keeps evolving. So what I'm excited about is not actually another drug. What I'm excited about is us figuring out how to utilize these thousands of drugs we now have and make sure that we get that to all the patients that need it. And Larry? Yeah, so I would um, echo all of that. You know, I think it's, it's this, you know, fascinating time. I mean, the last few years have been unbelievable. Mm -hmm. And both our um, understanding of the biology of breast cancer, but using that to develop these new drugs and to understand who they're gonna work for and who they're not gonna work for. Yeah. Um, and it's really been a paradigm shift um, over the last decade. And I'm old enough to remember what it used to be like, but uh, things are happening very, very quickly. And we're able to do things in ways that make scientific sense. Uh, in ways that we were never able to do before. Mm -hmm. um, and these are translating lifetime into benefits for patients. Uh, and so, you know, I think that the advances that we're making now are huge, but it's just such a strong link. And this is what BCRF does. It's this link between what happens in the laboratory and what gets translated into new drugs, new paradigms for treatment, as Sonia was saying, understanding different subsets of breast cancer better than we've ever understood them before and making all of those linkages. And then finally, as we've been talking about, figuring out how to make sure we get those new advances and new treatments to everybody equally, both in the US and elsewhere in the world. And so I, I don't have a favorite of everything. People always say, you know, what's your favorite book? You know, well, I have 50 favorite books. I have a lot of favorite things about what we're doing at breast cancer research right now, yeah. but it's in biology to clinical translation and the delivery of cancer care more broadly across the globe. Yes, I think, you know, both of you couldn't have said it better. The, the progress over the last 30 years has just been tremendous and it is right now at such a rapid pace and progressing so quickly, but really our urgent goal needs to be, and this is part of what BCRF does, as you said, is to make sure that these can get to everybody, every patient, no matter where they are or 
from where they come from um, and that they get the benefits equally. If, if I could just phrase that, just if I, Dorea, you know, BCRF has worked hard as we've all worked with you to inch up the cure rate, you know, and when we do that, uh, we save lives. Um, and as Sonia said earlier, and you've said, I think, you know, the cure rates now are so much better than they were one decade ago, two decades ago, three decades ago. Yeah. Um, but if you wanted to turn around and save the literally a hundred times the number of lives for breast cancer that we have increased our survival rates for, just make what we now know available across the globe. Because right now, every year, millions of women across the globe are dying from breast cancer. And if they lived in Philadelphia, they would have survived or in Nashville. And, um, you know, so just thinking about lives saved, which is what as physicians were devoted to, that would be a huge impact, almost an unmeasurable impact. And, and, they, and I mean, I truly want to emphasize that because I don't think we wrap our heads around that properly a lot of times. I feel like a lot of resources go into the next big drug and I'm so excited about drug discovery as well, right? Like, because we still know that patients, despite getting adequate care, some patients still die from breast cancer and it's still a, just a frustrating um, experience when you're treating patients and you run out of options, right? Like that will always be frustrating for me. But I think when we think about everything we have now, if we could get it to everyone, as Larry said, can you imagine um, what this conversation would look like in a couple of years?